All right, all right, all right. This is Ross, and welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, nine o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, and uh, how to grow that stuff. But and sometimes we talk about <laughs> how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in tonight's episode of Fur Talk, because in all honesty, in the, I don't know how many episodes it's been, it's almost, I think, 80 at this point. Out of 80 episodes, we started out pretty strong <clears throat> talking about food in the kitchen. But since we've talked a lot, it's definitely been the majority has been about growing these different fruits and vegetables. And um, so I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a garden update. We'll talk about the garden, um, where it's at and everything like that. And then how I've been using the food that I've been harvesting in the garden um, to then, you know, make sure I have food all year long, how I've been preserving it, pickling it, reducing it into jam or sauce, um, making meals like the meal you see here in front of me. Um, this was a little pasta dish here that we uh, we topped it off with some pecorino romano we got some some shrimp in there we got some of our own cherry tomatoes we got the broccoli raw we got the onions we got the garlic um, we got the shiitake mushrooms if you just combine garlic with fennel broccoli rob and mushrooms you just have gold right there I mean you can't lose in my opinion so I had this the other night this is one of my favorite things to make of course we had to have some wine with it we had uh, a little Malbec here this is um, <clears throat> a new wine to me that I actually was quite impressed by but it's more of a you know a wine that you would dr you would drink with food and it's kind of a in my opinion a, a really nice table wine really nice wine for eating um, which some of my other wines that I like to drink are more bold and I like to kind of enjoy them by themselves after uh, after dinner. But that was one of our meals. We've also been, you know, getting some random different fruits and vegetables that we have been uh, even picking up at the store or friends have been sending us. This is a plum that we got recently that I found at uh, H Mart. It's a local Asian market by me. And they actually have, I believe, our green gauge plums. Um, the other option, I can't remember the name of it, but there was one other option for this plum uh, that someone had posted on Instagram that I thought was pretty close to what it was, if not an exact match. Um, some people had suggested Shiro. And regardless, I think uh, it's cool to be able to taste that plum, whatever it is, green gauge or this other plum that I uh, that someone had recommended it's a great plum it's really wonderful a friend of mine Bill had also sent us some some pawpaw it's time it's that time of the year guys for pawpaw we did a video on that on the YouTube channel it's gonna come out very soon I hope you guys get to uh, get to watch that one that's a wonderful wonderful fruit I can't believe um, really how good it is especially some of the name varieties i don't know necessarily if all the seedlings are going to stack up in terms of flavor um at least the seedlings i've had have not been all that great and i've heard also the other side of the debate is well you know um actually if you even if you have a bunch of name varieties there's not a whole lot of difference in flavor um, they're not really all that different, like let's say figs are, um, even some apples are, things like that with huge genetic diversity within them. Um, mangoes is another great example. Uh, we've also been getting things like our, our raspberries. We've mostly been eating a lot of the stuff fresh. Our, our grapes, our melons are coming in, continually coming in. They just, they don't stop, um, which is great. Even though they haven't been the best as we've talked about on on last week's episode you know there's still it's a nice thing to have um <clears throat> now in terms of the garden 
we've been getting a lot of, um, you know, things like tomatoes, uh, peppers, eggplants, cucumbers. We had a, a lot of zucchini, the patty pan squash for quite some time. Um, and, you know, what do you do with all those kind of things? Because in the summer garden, you just are kind of overrun. You got a lot of herbs. You probably have maybe some things, you know, left over from the, the spring garden. You have probably some things that are starting in the, the fall garden. Like right now I have plenty of endive. I have uh, arugula. We've got even some broccoli rob, it looked like, that came in already, uh, which is kind of insane. Um you know, we're starting to get things actually like broccoli and it won't be too far before I can harvest quite a few of the side shoots. Um, you know, what do you kind of do with all these things? Because it, it can kind of get overwhelming. You can't eat everything fresh. You know, if you look through a lot of my photos here, this is why I have this open. You obviously can get a sense of really how much food I was able to harvest this year. It, it really was insane, guys. It, it was it was nuts in, in terms of, and it's continuous, you know. Um, it's not like it's stopping. Certain things have certainly stopped in the last week or two. Like um, the melons are petering off. The cucumbers are done. Um, most of the cucurbits are done. You know, the, um, the patty pan squash now is over. I could have definitely succession planted a lot of this stuff and I, I would be still harvesting a bunch of this, but things like the tomatoes, you know, things like the peppers, the eggplants, they don't stop. They, they really just keep going. If you can keep them healthy, even if I could keep the cucurbits healthy for a longer period of time, they inevitably get some, some mildew here and it kind of ruins them. But if you can keep those plants really disease free and healthy, you pretty much are going to be guaranteed food for a stupidly long time. I mean, I'll have tomatoes all the way till frost, peppers, eggplants, all the way till frost. So, kind of, what do you what do you do with all this stuff? You know, um, so that's what we're going to talk about. And of course, you got a lot of this stuff. You can make things like stir fries and and salads, and you know. I guess a couple tips with the stir fries and things like that. It's really hard, in my opinion, um, to beat something with potatoes in it. And I'll tell you, we've talked about in the past, the German Butterball, um, the Yukon Gold. We had German Butterball last year. We had Yukon Gold the year before, and now this year we also have Yukon Gold. The German Butterball is a superior potato for sauteing in the pan with some olive oil, some garlic. It just is incredible. The texture on that potato is mind blowing, especially if you cut them into nice thin slices, almost like chips, but a little thicker. You get them fried up a bit. They are so incredibly good. Now the Yukon Gold produces a potato it's got a flavor like none other I've tried. Although the, the German Butterball, I didn't waste a single potato last year towards a baked potato. You know, every single one of those was for a stir fry, sauteing them, etc. Where, you know, the, the Yukon Gold this year, we've had a, a couple nights of baked potatoes and I've never had a baked potato like that. I really was quite surprised. Um, they have a, a really distinct, earthy, and nutty flavor that I have never, ever, in 29 years of eating potatoes. I mean, we eat a lot of potatoes here in the United States. I have never had a baked potato that good. Um, so it's it's a quite an interesting variety, and I think well, the potato has many uses, but I think in a stir fry, it's on un, it's unbeatable um, as a nice base. You know, we talked about, at least I added some pasta to that other dish, but, you know, fennel, um, onions, you know, um, I mean, I had the broccoli rob, any sort of brassica, it's going to be so great in these, um, in these particular stir fries. But I'm looking forward to actually something new in a stir fry sense is I'm thinking about kohlrabi. I'm thinking about a Savoy cabbage. We do have some of that coming up. Believe it or not, that is doing well in our fall garden, and I'm looking forward to that more than probably anything else. 
trying those in some sort of stir fry and seeing what comes up. And kohlrabi is one of them. You know, you can kind of make it into a pasta substitute or um, kind of get it, you know, even just throw it in there in your in your stir fry. I feel like it's going to really add some nice brassica flavor to your dishes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to those two in the kitchen. Um, you know, what else are we throwing in these stir fries? I, I don't have too many other tips, I think. It's really, in my opinion, if you can cook the stuff, it's going to obviously be better. And the better you cook it to perfection, the better it's going to taste. You know, everyone's going to have their preferences. Everyone's going to want either more garlic or less garlic or more salt or less salt or, you know, more olive oil or less olive oil. But you get some salt, some olive oil, some garlic, some potatoes, maybe a little bit of uh, onion. You got to have the mushrooms. I don't care. You you can cook these mushrooms for a long time. You can put them almost in right away with the potatoes and get them nice and fried up. You know, those you, you really should cook your mushrooms a bit longer um, than some of the other th- things that you're uh, you're cooking. And if you do that right, you're just gonna have immense uh, immense flavor in your food. Um, and then from there, you can pretty much add anything you want. You know, um, become really a big fan of beets in terms of cooking them. Um, you know, I've been I've become a big fan of the of even baking some foods. Let's talk about baking for a minute because I believe it or not. As much as I love the potato, I actually think the eggplant makes the best fries. And I have tried, uh, believe it or not, let's see here. I have a variety called Ping Tung, which is a a more long and slender eggplant. You can kind of see it like this. This is kind of what they look like. And because they're they're longer and slender, not, you know, more of this, um, this... I don't know how to describe this shape, but just a, a bigger shape to it, like you would typically see in more of these Italian eggplants, like a like a diamond eggplant. Um, you, you know, these are going to be better because they have more flesh to them, the bigger size, and they're going to then be better for things like soaking, getting all that flavor, absorbing all that flavor. Things like eggplant parm. You know, getting all that sauce, getting all that olive oil, getting all that flavor that you put into that dish and soaking that up. I mean, that's really what that flesh is so good uh, for with an eggplant. Whereas if you get these, you know, these long and slender ping tongue, ping tongue Asian type eggplants, you know, it's really the more Asian types that are going to have these, uh, these slender shapes to them. If you can cut them... Um, basically long wise and you can kind of make them into thin strips almost like fries like you would see it like McDonald's or something but maybe even a little bit thinner and a little bit longer they're gonna then have really amazing amazing texture and flavor because when you bake them they're gonna get nice and crispy on the skin the inside is gonna absorb that flavor that you put in with your other vegetables when you were baking it things like olive oil and salt and other vegetables and things like that so you know if you really wanted to you know i i think it's personally better to have both you know if you wanted to have one for different purposes versus the other but for sure i've never had an eggplant this good if you're cutting your eggplant i think really the big difference maker is just really in the way that i've been cutting it too because if you're cutting it like in circles and you're going, you know, you're you're going like this with your cuts rather than going longwise with your cuts, you're just going to get a different eating experience. You really are. And maybe that has a lot to do with it, but the fact that there's less flesh and there's more skin really makes a huge difference and I swear to you, they make the best fries. Eggplant fries are insane so every time i get my eggplants i make myself these uh eggplant fries in the in the oven and i just can't believe how good they are they don't even take that long to cook you can even burn them up a little bit and they're still really really good they'll get to the super crispy state and they're like amazing guys so that's my big tip at least this year for baking um 
you know, I like to do the the stuffed peppers, the stuffed zucchini, the stuffed patty pan squash. Put those in the oven. Um, here's actually a photo of something we threw in the oven earlier this year. I really should take more photos, but this was a whole mix of stuff. We had some Brussels sprouts. Love Brussels sprouts in the oven. We had all different types of beans. I find the dragon tongue bean, by the way, is incredible in the oven. Uh, we had obviously some uh, some squash. We had some beets. Beets do really well in the oven as well. Potatoes, garlic, onion. I just cut this stuff up, not even really into smaller pieces. Just cut it up real quick, put it on the pan, seasoned it well, and then threw it in there. And it was heaven. I'm telling you, it was uh, it was something. So, you know, baking, sautéing, grilling, whatever it is you guys want to do. Um, I think there's many ways to do it. Obviously, there's many different vegetables, and I think certain things obviously have better, you know, better ways to cook them. And maybe there's even a better way than I don't. I'm sure there is a better way that I don't know of. But um, yeah. Really love those eggplant fries. And then some of this other stuff that we've been getting, this is where we're, I think we're really gonna get into the nitty gritty here because, you know, we, like I said, we have cucumbers. How many cucumbers can you eat in a day? Not many. I mean, unless they're pickled, right? Uh, how many tomatoes can you eat in a day? You know, how many, um, you know, peppers can you eat? It's just like, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of food. And it, even, there's such great foods for preserving and turning them into something that can last a long time or into some other form. Honestly, my favorite form of a tomato is in the form of sauce when you cook them. And you can make an argument, they're so good, fresh, but if you cook them, they're incredible. Um, you know, my favorite form of a cucumber is, is pickled. You know, um, my favorite form of peppers actually is when you preserve them in vinegar. So, um, I don't necessarily, you know, know what I would have done. And this year I, I got really into this stuff. I think, you know, earlier in when fruit talk really first started, I was on this crazy fruit, this food journey of really, you know, trying different things. And, um, that was kind of just my life and that little, you know, time of the, of my life at that, at that particular time. And, we haven't necessarily had that since, unfortunately. So we haven't really talked too much about, you know, these kind of food aspects. And, you know, in all honesty, I used to have some help preserving and, and cooking some of this stuff. Now I don't. Um, so even last year when, well, we didn't have really the year that we're having this year in terms of our garden, but even then I wasn't too big on preserving different things. We did some jams, we did some sauce. Um, yeah, we did some pickles, but it wasn't nearly as intense as it was this year. I mean, I have seriously, if you divide my time up this year, you know, a lot of your time is dedicated to the garden, getting everything going, you know, taking care of those young tender plants, making sure they all need what they, you know, get what they need. And as they mature and as they get older and, and things just don't need our attention nearly as much, um, you're that de you're then able to really dedicate a lot of your time instead to harvesting. I mean, that's really where your time should be going, right? So most of my time outside is harvesting or protecting different crops. And then I would say even half of my time is then in the kitchen. So it's weird to then think about this in the sense that, well, how much time do I really spend outside every day, every week, every month? depending on, it depends on the time of the year. And I've always given that answer very loosely and, and try to really describe it to you guys. Well, now we're at that time of the year where a lot of my time is actually being spent in the kitchen. And we, again, we just went nuts. So I don't even have the photos to really do it justice, but you know, here's some of the sauce that we were, we've been making. And this was a batch. Actually, we changed the food processor that we were using. It's a bigger, more heavier duty, made this whole process so much easier to deal with. Um, but I'll tell you, um, this one is pretty darn chunky, but also has a lot of skins in it. And normally, this is what's gonna happen. If you cook your, your tomatoes the way I do, it, what I, 
you know, what I'll do is I'll, it's very obvious right here is I'll, I'll cut them all in half on the cutting board, take all that pulp out, all the gel, all the seeds, get rid of all that because I want it to cook down. I want it to get to a very thick consistency to it. Um, I don't necessarily care for a very smooth, uniform consistency to my sauce, right? I don't mind the chunkier peanut butter, you know? I don't mind the the uh, the chunkier sauce. So I'm not going out of my way. People have those little grinder things where they basically get their tomatoes all through that and it gets rid of all the pulp, all that fiber, all those seeds, um, all the skins. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm getting rid of the seeds because I don't necessarily agree with that. But the skins normally, if, you know, you, I had my food processor set right, um, the skins get chopped up pretty good. And you don't even really end up eating the skins or even noticing the skins. This particular batch it was a shame. But what I could do is actually before I use this batch is then run it through the food processor the right way. These skins will get chopped up. I won't even really have to worry about it, but you know, it is a, it is really not a big process. And I think a lot of people get overwhelmed just in general with new things and learning new things. They definitely get overwhelmed in the kitchen. People struggle with this kind of stuff. Here's a batch of sauce that we did. Always do the garlic first, homegrown garlic, put that in the pan, get it brown with some olive oil, throw your tomatoes in after you had food process them, throw my herbs in, I throw my cheese in, um, throw some red pepper in there, some salt, you know, all these ingredients really make such an incredible flavorful sauce that I think people really underestimate um, just how amazing a homegrown tomato turned into homemade sauce can be. It's unbelievable. I really have spoiled myself. Um, I can't buy canned sauce anymore. Um, you know, I can doctor it up pretty good, but, and I know a lot of people out there, maybe you guys are a little purist with this kind of stuff. People are pretty particular about their sauce, man. Um, but I know there's a lot of people in Italy and, and they're very pure. Maybe they only use one or two or three ingredients in their sauce and that's it. You know, they'll, when they do their sauce, maybe they'll add the basil, the olive oil, maybe some garlic, maybe even not even that, you know? Um, so for me, I really love a lot of flavor in my sauce. This stuff is basically crack. I'm telling you, it's insane. The herbs I like to add, by the way, is fennel, um, fennel leaf, believe it or not. Um, you could add some fennel seed. I got some rosemary and obviously basil. You just can't go wrong. People. Can even you can even add oregano. I've added oregano plenty of times, although I don't grow it myself. It'd probably be even better if I did. Um, you probably don't even need that many herbs. You know, it's it's just it's all in the tomato, and it really it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. That when you cook this stuff down, it's just like making jam. You're basically throwing it into the pot. You're getting all that water to evaporate. You're reducing it, and it's turning into the consistency that you want. As it evaporates more and more and more, those fruits that you throw into the pot, into the pot, those turn into jam. Um, a lot of them, I never even have to add pectin to. Um, almost, i almost, I don't, I've never even purchased pectin. <laughs> so you know, I've basically gotten away. I think with growing all these different um, fruits to make them in the jam and it just really made it really obvious how this all sort of connects. If you know how to make sauce or you know how to make jam, you know how to make the other two things. And then you also know how to make, believe it or not, salsa. So I was, I was really impressed. This is a new thing we did this year. I was really trying to learn how to do this. I made it sort of a mission. I met somebody that uh, knew how to make salsa. They taught me how to make it. Uh, really, really simple. All you do is get your ingredients, your food process it. We actually post about this on our our Instagram and Facebook. Um, here's actually our, our um, one of our batches of salsa. 
you get all your ingredients. So, you, you know, I had on one day, I tried this a couple different times. I tried it once originally with the way that uh, a friend of mine taught me. If I can find the photo of it here, I'll show you guys exactly what I mean. But we had pretty pretty fresh. It was really, it was super, super fresh. Here we go. So we ended up buying some habaneros because I wanted to make it spicy. Ended up buying some tomatillos because I wanted to see how that would change things. But even prior to this, we really added in um, really just all of our ingredients into the food processor. And then it was so fresh, so amazing in its flavor. Um, I couldn't really believe it. I was shocked. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you can't buy a salsa like that. You just can't. And um, so it was, it really was quite spectacular. And then I started experimenting with different ways to change it and make it different. And like I said, I threw in the tomatillos, I threw in the habanero. Um, we threw in some corn in one of them, but if you just get the base ingredients of, you know, onion, tomatoes, peppers, um, lime, salt, pepper, um, you know, what are some of the other base ingredients? Just, just your really basic salsa. If you get that right, um, you're golden, you know? Um, now here's where my issue kind of came in is that when I first made it, it was really liquidy and you can get different types of salsa. I know you guys know this. So you can get something that's thicker like this that you'd probably see, uh, m you know, more uniform, um, probably see this in like a Tostitos jar as an example, or you can get those salsa that maybe you'd find at like Sam's or Costco. I think I've seen them there where they're really runny and there's a lot of water in it, but they're very fresh. It's a fresher uh, flavor to it. And that's kind of like the first version. But if you want to, you really want to make this thicker, like Tostitos, you just cook it down. It's the same thing of like making sauce. You cook it down, same thing like making jam. You cook it down, it just completely changes the consistency, changes the uh, even the, little, the flavor a little bit. Um, it's just wild. Now, what I need to do on the next go around, because I actually haven't done it since we made it like, I think two or th two or three times this year, what you can do is actually cook the vegetables prior, roast them or saute them in the pan, then food process them, then throw them in the pan and reduce them. And you know, it just works out super, super well. Oh, also you could throw in some garlic. That's probably enough. That's another base requirement. I think, um, then we did a video cause we're, you can move on now. I think from reducing different vegetables, it's, it's really quite simple, but, um, I'm glad we got to talk about it. But one of the videos we did recently, believe it or not, was the, the pickle patch, <laughs> we called it. And this is on the YouTube channel where we talked about our, our cucumbers in the beginning and we showed you guys the patch. And then we showed you guys, which by the way, it sort of died off really quite quickly right after this video. We harvested our last little cucumbers and then this is kind of what I'm doing here um, in this video is making the pickles. And this is with my great grandfather's recipe. And the beautiful part of this recipe is that once you know how to pickle one thing, you can pickle anything. You can do anything you want. There is no limits on this. Um, it's amazing. It really is. So what you can do is that you need to get the right, really the right vinegar to water to salt ratio. And that kind of seems a bit daunting, but it's not. Really, you just throw everything in the jar. You can see I've got all the pick, all the cucumbers cut up into this the size and shape that I want. Throw them in the jar, pack them in there, and then you just start adjusting the amount of vinegar and water that you're gonna pour in the in the jar. Um, for at least my great grandfather's pickle recipe, it's pretty simple. Um, it's one cup white vinegar to two cups water, 
And then the ratio of that is one tablespoon of salt. And I like to use kosher salt. You can really go crazy with uh, different salts like pickling salts and different things like that. But this one I find is, uh, is pretty good um, for sure. I really like using kosher salt. But I'll tell you that ratio is really just the key. Okay. So it's really just three cups of liquid. That's kind of how you have to measure this is really the amount of liquid to the amount of salt. Um, cause if you have, let's say, you know, you adjust this for a lower batch, right? Let's say you don't have three cups of liquid that you can afford to put into these jars. Um, you got to adjust that down and then also adjust the salt because you can very easily make these things too salty. You can very easily also make them too vinegary. So depending on what you want, depending on what, you know, what kind of thing you're doing, it could change and you could do anything you want in terms of pickling, you know, green beans. I did some radishes this year. I even did some green onions. Um, I mean, you can think about, think about it, anything you want. I was thinking about even doing some zucchini, um, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of pickling. You could pickle anything. We've done kimchi in the past. I guess that's sort of a form of pickling, right? Uh, sauerkraut, right? I guess it's fermenting, but you know, uh, again, you just got to get that right salt ratio to the right water ratio in those different things. And you're, you're pretty much solid. Um, so the last thing, even that I want to mention about is also the, the peppers that you can pickle, but not necessarily pickling them. Oh, one other thing we can pickle is tomatoes, believe it or not. Um, people actually pickle tomatoes quite often. I think a really good one to do that I've discussed here on the YouTube channel is actually pickling them, the cherry tomatoes at the end of the year. Cause you always just end up with way too many cherry tomatoes and you don't, you can't really do anything with them. Frost comes around, your vines are filled with tomatoes and you're just sitting there and you're like, what am I gonna do with all these? You know, they're green, they're not really that great to eat fresh. Well, you just stab them with some toothpicks, two holes in each cherry tomato, throw them in the pickle jar, you're done. Um, you got yourself some amazing cherry tomatoes that are pickled. So I think it's wonderful. I think it's a great thing to do. Um, and then the last thing is actually the preserved peppers that we just did. And I know everybody knows about these preserved peppers, peppers, right? Preserved peppers in oil or vinegar, whatever, right? Um, these are a great little treat. I know a lot of Italian people love these damn things and you could throw in all kinds of stuff, right? These people got it going right here. And I'm telling you mine came out amazing this year. I really went a little nuts with some of the things in here. Let's see what they are adding because I'm interested to know. They're putting in some bell peppers, garlic, olive oil. That's it. But they've got some other things in here. I don't know. I'm interested to know what other people are throwing in their preserved peppers. Usually it's it'll say on the jar if you're buying them, right? But I'll tell you... Um, Mine came out so, so good. What you do, the only difference in terms of pickling them is that you'll basically just take the peppers, you get all the seeds out, you throw them on the stove in a pan with some olive oil, and you get them nice and charred, fire roasted. Even if you can smoke them a little bit, maybe you have them on the grill, take them off, throw them in the, in the jar, stuff them in there nice and tight, and throw in your vinegar, throw in your salt, throw in your, your, uh, your garlic, Throw in some olive oil. I even threw in some olive oil. And I did two different types of vinegar, the apple cider vinegar, some white vinegar. Oh, my goodness, these things are flavorful. I'm telling you. Um, I even threw in some um, some tomatoes with them. Yeah, I forget what else I put in there because I think I put one other ingredient in there, and I wish I remembered. I wish I, I, wish I took some photos of all this stuff. Oh, and the one last thing, I even did this today. I can't believe I've, I forgot about this. The last thing that we did recently was making pesto. And 
this is also equally as easy. I mean, a food processor really goes a long way. I think, honestly, you have a garden, you have an orchard, you need a couple things. You need a dehydrator, you need a juicer, you need a food processor. What else do you need? I mean, those are really the three most common things I use. Uh, and really nothing goes to waste at that point. You're always processing it down into something. You need a pan and a stove, right? <laughs> you need some olive oil. Um, but the pesto is so simple as well. Really, even if you don't have enough basil, other herbs work in so well into a pesto that it's crazy. You know, you got your olive oil, you got your garlic, you got your walnuts or your pine nuts. Um, there's one other ingredient I'm, I'm blanking on that I threw in there today. But let's say you don't have enough basil. Um, it's so, so easy. You just got your carrots. You know how many carrots I got right now? They're sitting in the ground, mostly for juicing purposes. As I juice the beets and the carrots uh, every other week or every week. Um, you know, it's pretty insane because those carrots have tops <laughs> and the tops get wasted. Um, instead of wasting them, why don't you just throw them into your pesto? And there you got basically a carrot basil pesto that I, I swear to you is so incredibly good. You guys won't believe it. So all you do, and I, as I've kind of, I mean, you could probably figure it out, is you just throw all those ingredients into a food processor in the right ratio, and that's it. I mean, you're done. Throw it in the in the canning jar, put it in the fridge, put it in the freezer, you're done. There's nothing to worry about, guys. Um, it's crazy. You know, and I, I haven't even really gone into the, you know, the lengths of, um, you know, of really making um, some extra effort into sterilizing these things. You know, wash the jar before I use it. Um, but I'm not boiling these jars, you know, I'm not letting them sit out even, um, at room temperature, everything's going in the fridge or in the freezer, you know, so you can make this stuff last a long time. You don't even have to go to the extra length if you don't want. Um, and it's just, it's insane. Um, I think it's underrated. I think, uh, it's a big skill. All these things I mentioned, is an insanely important skill for you as a grower because if you don't know how to cook some of this stuff, it just doesn't it doesn't make necessarily all that much um, sense because some of it you can grow to eat fresh, which is great. But yeah, I mean you you get so much better flavor and benefit if you can you can cook some of the stuff, and it really isn't all that difficult, guys. I'll tell you that right now. Anyone out there watching? At this point, that doesn't know how to cook, shame on you because there is absolutely no reason that you can't cook. Um, that pisses me off more than anything. <laughs> you just don't want to. You don't want to cook, and you don't want to learn how to cook. But I'll tell you, there's no excuse. You can make something like this. There's no reason to go to a restaurant. You know, um, I, ne I almost never go to restaurants anymore because I know how to cook better than most restaurants. Um, the only way I'm going to a restaurant is for some awesome food experience and I'm willing to pay for that. Otherwise, I'm, I'm mostly making my food at home and I'm enjoying the food the way that I want to enjoy it, you know. Um, of course, obviously, there's other reasons to go out to eat, but... Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Fruit Talk. Um, what are you guys getting from the garden? And then how are you using it in the kitchen? Um, what are you doing with your foods? Maybe there's something I haven't mentioned necessarily. Maybe there's something you guys pickle or cook that I haven't um, been using. And you think it would be a great idea if I grow it here on the, on the, uh, in the garden, showcase it here on the channel. Love to hear what you guys have to say on that. Those are some of my most favorite comments as you guys telling me what you're doing in your garden or in your orchard. 
We'll see everybody soon, all right? If you guys like this episode, consider rating us on uh, iTunes or leaving a comment on the video. Um, and also, if you guys are, are really loving this, you're loving the uh, the channel, the podcast, consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Check out our blog, figboss.com. Um, follow us on Facebook and Instagram on our YouTube channel. We're also on uh, Spotify, iTunes, all the different podcasting sites. I'm sure you guys know this at this point. We'll see you all soon, all right? Take care, stay safe out there, and uh, keep growing, all right? Peace.